Okay. Welcome everyone um, to this to this dev talk. Um, let me kick things off by warmly welcoming both our, our dear panelists that we have here today and you, the audience, of course. Thank you for joining us. It's an immense pleasure to be here with you today and to be moderating this dev talk uh, on, on gender equality, which is, of course, an extremely important topic and something that we are going to be discussing here today with an expert panel of, of very impressive and knowledgeable panelists. My name is Ragnheiður Raga Arnodóttir, and I am the director of the OECD Development Center. And to the topic, I would say that, that most citizens would agree that, that gender equality is not only good in and of itself, but that it also improves the performance of, of economies and of societies. And yet, Today, we are witnessing a regression in attitudes towards gender role, roles and, and domestic violence. COVID-19 made things worse. Uh, it increased women's unpaid care responsibilities, as well as incidents of violence against women. Gender equitable norms and laws are being overturned all around the world. Today, we are here to uncover the causes of this backsliding. And more importantly, we are also here to discuss what to do to avoid further setbacks. And I just want to mention that this dev talk also comes at a very special time for the OCD Development Center. We are celebrating our 60th anniversary in a couple of weeks with ministers and high level officials from all of our 53 non OECD and OECD member countries gathering around the same table at our eighth high level meeting. And the center has been thinking long and hard about how to sustain or increase, of course, the value we bring to our members. And I sincerely hope that our discussion here today will feed that thinking. And just for the, for the, the advertising part of this dev talk, I also would like to warmly invite you for, to join us for our, our third uh, dev talk leading up to the HLM, which is on, on October 20th. And there we will discuss how developing countries can juggle low carbon transitions with providing energy access to, to millions of, of citizens, another burning issue. But once again, thank you to our fantastic experts for your precious time. And I will now have the honors of introducing you uh, first, I would like to introduce Naila Kopes, Kapes, uh, Professor of, of Gender and Development at the Gender Institute at, at the London School of Economics and, and Political Science. Another political scientist, uh, Hanna Birna Kristjansdóttir, she is the Senior Advisor for Women's Leadership for UN Women, and she is also the Chair of the Reykjavik Global Forum Board. And she is also the only one on this panel who can pronounce my name correctly. So obviously, um, we will we will have a, a secret secret Icelandic chat here. Um, Vassal Vanden, Vandenberg, he is man care officer at Equimundo and is joining us now from Kigali. Uh, so we have a, a, a truly truly global panel. And last but not least, uh, he is in Park. She is here in Paris uh, with me, an economist and uh, the gender program coordinator at the OECD Development Center. So this is a fantastic panel and I'm looking very much uh, to the discussion. But before we begin, I would like to, to uh, a note for the, the audience and we want to hear from you. Uh, so please have your say. And, and, and there are two ways to do in that uh, here today. First, we will kick off the, the first and second half of this discussion through poll questions uh, to start, start us off. So I'm, I'm counting on you to vote and give your answer to the questions that will appear on the screen. Unfortunately, us here in the, in the, on the panel and, and um, who will be participating in the, in the discussion, we cannot vote. There's uh, something that we need to, to have a chat about with the organizing team uh, for the next one. Um, but second uh, way of, of interaction from the, the audience, 
our panelists will happy to take your will be happy to take your your questions, and we will have a, a Q and A session in the in the end. And you can enter your your questions in the Zoom chat, and we will we will get them um, address them in the in the Q and A session after the panel discussion. But I am now going to stop talking and let me kick things off right away with the first poll question, which will appear on your screen. Um, there it is. And you see the, the question, what are the main drivers of today's setback to gender equality? And you choose one. Is it social media, discriminatory laws and social norms, the gender pay gap, poor visibility and representation of women? This is something that I will ask you to to answer, and you have maybe thirty seconds or a minute um, to do do so. Um, but I will start this conversation by giving the floor to Hishin and ask you sort of to to briefly set the scene. Um, and of course, I am I am curious to hear your views on the on the audience's answer. And if the polls are in, uh, social media 5%, overwhelming 85% uh, put discriminatory laws and social norms as the number one driver. Um, gender pay gap, 0%, that is, that is interesting. Poor visibility and representation of women, uh, 10%. So, Hishin, this is a this is a, an indication that the SIGI work that we're doing here at the OECD, uh, the word is getting out. Over to you. Thank you very much, Raga. Indeed, um, I think I I'll be preaching to the choir. So um, I would still like to start by echoing what she just said uh, in the intro. Gender equitable norms and laws are indeed being overturned around the world, unfortunately. Uh, we've heard many times the COVID-19 crisis has disproportionately affected women on many folds. The recession shadowing the pandemic was uh, frequently called a she session or more accurately a mom session as women's work losses were driven largely by the mother's outcomes. Um, during the pandemic, the introduction of lockdowns, mobility restrictions, and school closures have greatly increased the time spent on household chores for both men and women, but still more for women, conforming or even reinforcing the traditional caring roles of women and mothers. We also saw a sharp rise in domestic violence, and millions of girls have suffered consequences of not being able to attend schools, or um, not to continue with their education. The COVID-19 is not the only one single thing that we're facing now. Um, the climate crisis is here and it is likely to intensify over the next decade, putting pressure on the most vulnerable women and girls. And the war on Ukraine and its consequent economic crisis together with the food security um, and energy crisis is affecting women and girls disproportionately um, especially in developing countries. And other events such as the overturn of Roe v. Wade in the US is a testimony that women's physical integrity and own agency is in danger. And the recent events in Iran um, that we're seeing are also showing us that gender equality is far from a one battle in our diverse societies. And it also testifies how patriarchal or some of the masculine norms um, can dominate. So all of this is having a severe impact on girls and women's lives and ultimately on the well-being and well-functioning of our societies and economies. So why are we facing these rather unpleasant pictures and challenges? Uh, the work we have been doing at the OECD Development Center for over a decade now looks exactly at what drives gender inequality and what is holding back women and girls in different spheres. These are actually deeply entrenched discrimination that are embedded in our legal frameworks, social norms, and harmful practices. 
And we've been measuring this um, through our flagship index, uh, social institutions and gender index, what we call SIGI on a daily basis. So what the SIGI measures and uncovers are these hidden drivers, the invisible part of the iceberg that really drives what we see at the surface level, like the gender gap in labor force participation, pay gaps, unequal access to healthcare and reproductive rights and so on. Let me give you some simple examples. There are about one third of the population who actually thinks it is okay or it is justifiable that husbands beat their wives under certain circumstances. And actually this view is slightly more popular among women than among men. In where the share of people with this view is higher has also higher rates of domestic violence. Another example. We also know that half of global population thinks men make better leaders than women. And evidently societies, societies with higher share of people thinking that men make better leaders than women have smaller share of women that are represented in their decision-making positions. Perceptions and traditional views that women have to be protected as we protect children, probably also because there was an underlying norms that women cannot make informed decision like children is also reflected in existing laws in many countries by prohibiting them to enter certain sectors of employment, mostly seen as hazardous and labor intensive jobs. But it leaves no choice for women to make her own decisions uh, for jobs. So some of the rigid gender norms are really there to provide us with structural barrier to overcome. And they have direct consequences for women and girls empowerment. In recent years, we uh, at the Development Center have also focused a lot on masculinities to look, it, to look at the other side of coin and also to uncover um, the drivers of gender inequality in further states. And also it's a way to better engage with men and boys so that they can also be the uh, agents of changes. Some of the norms that we identified as restrictive for gender equality um, they lead to devaluation of women's paid and unpaid labor. The norms that real men are breadwinners and financially dominant, or the real men are ideal workers, which means they are competitive or dedicated in the sense that they prioritize work over private life, making themselves available continuously and full time. And such norms, all of them lead society's belief that jobs especially those formal jobs are more for men than women. And men's labor is thus more important than that of women's, consequently devaluating women's labor. And it also makes it easier uh, for women to be excluded from the labor force, higher status jobs and more um, decision-making positions. And subsequently, it has rather a negative impact on inclusive growth and a well-functioning economy because we're just not fully utilizing half of the population. Um, so uh, my point was to, my point to what it, that I wanted to make deliver was to, that the discriminatory social institutions matter for gender equality. Uh, thank you, Raga. Over to you. Thank you very much, Hyotin. And these are startling, startling facts. Um, we hear this. I mean, this is not the first first meeting that I personally have attended on gender equality. And every time you hear these these facts repeated, you wonder we're in in twenty within in the year twenty twenty two, and we have so many wins to regain and, and, and battles to, to continue. Um, and it's very important to, to discover these, these uh, key drivers that they're uncovered uh, so, we, so we can uh, get to the root of the problem. Um, over to you, Hannah. You are, you are uh, an experienced uh, expert on gender equality from everything that you have been doing. Um, if, if we first, if we go back to the poll question, uh, I would love to hear your your thoughts on the audience's answer uh, answer if you if you agree with it, and and what do you think are the root causes of of gender in, gender inequality today? Thank you so much, Raka, and I'm so happy to be with you all here today. And let me sort of start from just thanking you, Raka, and the 
OECD Development Center of placing the focus on this issue and making sure that we are actually discussing these matters when we are discussing the solutions and challenges that we face and want to sort of work on today. I think that is absolutely vital. And as you mentioned in the beginning, more and more institutions, nations and people happily are seeing that gender equality is not sort of something personal only for women. It's a really big issue when it comes to making sure that we grow as the global world we are and to make sure. And, and thank you also here for pointing so sort of uh, well out the structure and the difficulties we're having. And I think Raka, on the on the poll, I must admit that I was a little bit surprised to see the dominance of one answer. Uh, but I think that reflects all of our views, because if we look at the options that our great audience had, is that this is the foundation. I mean, the, the laws and the social norms are the foundation. And I mean, I'm now placed in Reykjavik, Iceland. I face the parliament of Iceland. We are number one and have been for 13 years when it comes to gender equality. So this is our pride. This is what we are most proud of as a nation in what we have achieved. And we have not even achieved a full gender equality when it comes to law. No nation has. Uh, and the same goes, of course, for the social norms. And then again, I would like to congratulate OECD Development Center of everything you've done around the social institutions and gender index. These are exactly the numbers, the figures, and what we need to unveil in the biases of ourselves. And of course, when we're talking around the sort of gender equality issue, because I have been working for a fairly long time for UN women, which of course is our sort of global uh, identity that we look to for gender equality. And the sad thing now, Raka, is that although you're absolutely spot on, we've had progress. And that's, we always say that we've had humongous progress. But in the past years with the pandemic, we have gone over 30% backwards, if you like. So instead of us being able to sit here and say, okay, this will happen in 100 years, which was the case before COVID. We were supposed to have gender equality, sort of in general terms, in 100 years, but not a full economic gender equality until 200 years. We have now a setback with the pandemic of over 30%. So our young girls around the world are not getting education. Women are being sort of uh, placed in a way more difficult position than we've ever seen. And the marginalized groups are the ones that are suffering. And that is the sad thing that globally, we have moved backwards. And just sort of adding, because uh, you mentioned, Raka, that we host here in Reykjavik, Iceland, what is called the Reykjavik Global Forum, Women Leaders, where we have 500 women leaders from around the world sitting together and saying, what can we do? And we even hear these voices, and I'm sure my panelists can share this with me. We still have the voices of people saying, is this really an issue? I mean, do we still need to sit down and talk about gender equality? And then I would just like to draw our attention, because that's my field of expertise, to the facts of the matter when it comes to leaders and gender equality. In 2022, less than 10% of heads of states are female. Less than 10%, meaning that over 90% are men. So this is where one would say, if you can't see it, you can't be it. If we want a diverse world, we need a diverse world states. And this is not something we have. And 80% of students, according to some research, when they close their eyes and they are asked, think about our leader, they see a middle-aged white man in suits. And when we have this picture in our minds, nothing, in my opinion, will really change. And this is not the only figure that reminds us that we need to move and move fast, because under 20% of cabinet ministers in the world are women. Under 25% of parliamentarians in the world are women, and under 25% of CEOs in the world are women. So this is the stats that we see, this is the reality, and in my opinion, and this I will sort of leave as my closing argument for, for this section, this cannot be the case. This is not the world that any of us want to leave to our kids, our grandchild, us being able to say, you recall Raka when we were in politics in Iceland, we could even say, this will happen in our, our children's lifetime. They will have gender equality. All genders will have their equality. Now we cannot even say that it will be in the lifetime of our kids, let alone our grandchildren. 
and what have you. This is just simply not that something that we cannot not accept. And I really would like to end on the note, which I think you did so well in the beginning. This is a win-win issue, and we need to tackle it as such. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And again, startling, startling facts. And uh, where just to 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 follow up on wh where you ended, um, I've always or you know i've wondered what is the best argument to to move this issue along um to put it in in an economic perspective it makes economic sense if you if you think about um if if women played the same role as men in the labor market global income is estimated to go up 28 trillion dollars i mean that's an incentive that that can be used in the in the argument when not that you necessarily would need it because there are so many other good arguments and just uh because you were you were talking about the 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 position of of Iceland um which we are very proud of uh Icelanders but when listening to the the gender equality discussion in Iceland it it would not seem that we were on the top of the list because we want a uh, hundred percent equality. So, and that's where we where we all should be going. But going now to London, Naila, um, what do you think? Do you do you agree with with Hannah's assessment? Um, and 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 are there any other missing drivers that we're not not talking about? What is your what is your assessment? Well, I, I'd say that the uh, the decision the, the poll. Um, verdict on social norms and discriminatory laws is absolutely correct. It's absolutely correct because it is the underlying factor that um, underpins, you know, unequal gender, the, the pay gap, uh, the invisibility of women in politics. Now, social media, just put like that, is not a bad thing. Just to say social media is it's good or bad. No, it's a good thing. There's a great deal about social media that is very positive. What we should be talking about is online abuse, right? Because what has happened with, you know, when we talk about discriminatory laws and social norms, the laws are what the state and governments put into place. But they are only of any use if they filter down to cultural norms. So laws on their own are just the starting point. I think the issue of laws is to sometimes they are driven by cultural norms. You know, progressive movements put progressive laws into place. But very often we have tokenistic laws that have been put in place by governments wanting to look good in the international arena and they don't filter down. So the issue is how do we take action to make sure that progressive laws make everyday sense? And I think, you know, the one of the reasons I've become interested in the online abuse stuff is because it is a manifestation of an old problem, which is violence against women in the private domain and in the public domain. But social media, the Internet, you know, te technology has magnified its impact because so many people look to social media for their news, for companionship, and sections of them face horrible abuse. I think, you know, surveys that have been carried out by the Economic Intelligence Unit, by Plan International, by Amnesty, all tell us that sure, men get abused on social media, but just like violence against women has a particular sexualized, humiliating component, so too, the abuse that women get on social media revolve around their bodies, their sexuality, and their capabilities. And so, and I think there are certain groups, the fact that certain groups suffer far more is indicative of something. One is young women, girls and young women. Uh, they suffer on har uh, harassment in everyday life, and they suffer much more on social media. And think of what that is going to do for these young women who want to become uh, comfortable with, with the internet. You know, marginalized groups, um, people of color, people of the wrong sexuality, gender identity, they too get a disproportionate amount of abuse. 
But I think linking up to one of the other points of the poll is the fact that women who put their heads above the parapet politically get a great deal of abuse. So journalists, and we have the case of Rana Ayub in India, the, the amount of abuse that she's had. In Britain, women of color get far more abuse as MPs than white women, but one black woman got half of the abuse that was thrown at MPs in Britain, and that was Diane Abbott. A long-standing MP comes back again and again from her hackney constituency, yet of all the online abuse directed at MPs in Britain, she got half of it, and it is ugly. So what social media is doing is it's bringing the kind of abuse you might have got on the streets. Of course, there is intimate partner violence being carried into the, uh, into the, into the internet, you know, revenge porn and so on. But also, you know, people you don't know putting your address on media, revealing details about you that can identify you, threatening to rape and murder you, get at your family. So I'm, I'm, I find this very disturbing because it's like an old story on steroids because of the power of the internet. And of course, the impact of it, what we know from what people have told us is that it leads to um, stress, insomnia, you don't sleep well, and that is the psychological effects. And then you have the practical effects. You start self-censorship. You feel unable to give your views politically. You know, women who run for uh, politics throw themselves open to all kinds of sexual uh, imagery and, and uh, uh, abuse. So that means their ability to campaign and to, to speak to their constituency through the media is curtailed. And it's going to have an intergenerational impact. You know, we've seen the way that women in politics, the invisibility of women in politics, is partly because politics is a very uncomfortable place for women. It's a very personalized place, you know, a place where not your policies, but you and your body gets held up to ridicule. And if that goes on, and if we don't curtail that, you know, what is the future for young women wanting to go into politics? So how are we going to address this issue of invisibility? So I think, you know, um, absolutely, you know, discriminatory norms, discriminatory laws, they are the ideological face of patriarchy. But everything else we've talked about are the practical manifestations of patriarchy. The, the gender gap is there because who takes care of the kids? Who takes care of the elderly? Who doesn't get the kind of skills and opportunities? Who doesn't get promoted because they're not seen as authoritative in positions of power? So all of these things are manifestations, I think, the practical manifestations. But I, I am horrified at the language we see on social media and the language that is directed to women in terms of abuse, in terms of you know, things we would not tolerate in newspapers and magazines or anywhere else. We seem to tolerate on social media, and I don't know what the companies are doing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting point. Um, and, and one regarding the language. Uh, I often wonder when, when I see comments that, that the, it seems like the sitting behind the screen or in front of a screen at home gives you uh, the right to say whatever you would never say uh, face to face with a person. And that is just something that, that um, Sort of is, is out of this world how you how you uh, envision that um, online abuse is a new avenue for violence against women. You said, and I think that is that is also a very interesting point. Um, uh, an old story on steroids. There are some good good uh, uh, good sound bites to 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 continue our conversation, which up to now has been um, as regrettably oftentimes when we are discussing gender equality, it's a discussion uh, between women about women. So I'm very happy to have you with us uh, here, Vessel, um, because this, this is not, as, as uh, Hannah said, gender equality is not only about women. Uh, women. It's about uh, society as a whole, and it's a, it's a global need to advance on. And and do you think that that 
gender equality has become a, a, a polarizing issue. Um, and, and, and have we made enough progress when it comes to, to male buy-in? Why is it so difficult to get uh, men to participate in this conversation? Uh, I'm not saying that men are not interested, but just to be an active participant. What is your take on that? Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. I, 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 um, I also just want to start by, by um, echoing what Hannah and, and Nalia also said and, and um, really supporting the point that's, that working on gender equality is a, is a win-win issue. And also just to notice in, in social media how social distance now exacerbated by COVID, so the distance we have from each other has exacerbated polarization. On the question of whether gender equality has become a polarizing issue, I, I would actually flip around the causality there. I would actually say that polarization is one of the symptoms of gender inequality, that the, the deeper fundamental cause is gender inequality, that there is an underlying uh, marginalization of women, particularly because of their your uh, association with care work that leads to a, a, a lower value in society, and that exacerbates the polarization or, or in a sense legitimizes it. Um, in a context where, where all genders' voices count equally, where care is valued, and we, where status is not attached to dominance, a polarization would of course be much less likely. Um, so I, I'm at the, at the Inter-Parliamentary Union uh, 145th Assembly today and tomorrow, and um, we actually just received an update today that women's participation in the IPU assembly has gone down. So it is slightly lower at 35% to the previous assembly, which was at 38%. So it's a reduction of 3%, but I think perhaps more concerning and to underscore what, what the other panelists have also been saying that there are too many uh, single sex male delegations at the IPU assembly where the topic is uh, gender sensitive parliaments. And I, I think it's, it's, it's on the positive side, it's a, it's a good step forward that men are interested in this and contributing towards the con conversation. But uh, of course, not in isolation or not out of conversation with women leaders, uh, women politicians. Um, there's, a, there's a brief conversation I had earlier today where um, I was querying the, the, the performance of um, uh, male leaders in parliament. And I think on representation, there has been some progress. But uh, the, 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 of course, the elephant in the room is what influence do women MPs have? Um, and, you know, if you ask the question, which, how, how many laws, you know, per year were suggested by women MPs and were actually carried or taken forward? Um, that, I think, would be a much closer indicator of what actually shows influence. Um, but then also when one raises that question, not to um, go down the predictable road of saying that women should only be responsible for social welfare or care or violence prevention, but that the, 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 the gender parity is across the whole range of legislation. Um, it's not that women are only uh, contained within this relatively safe space of taking care of the nation, so to speak. Um, I, I just want to end and, and say that I I do think that we do have male politicians who are stepping up. Um, I think, uh, of course, we need men in the personal private space at home to become more involved in care work, but also, of course, to endorse legislation that would support gender equality, um, like parental leave, like uh, subsidized child care, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think the COVID pandemic has been, uh, sadly, I don't think it's been our last pandemic. I think it has been a, a, a test for us as a, as, a, as, a, as a planet on how ready we are for global emergencies. And of course, the climate uh, change emergency that is looming or that is present and is already quite, quite severe is the next big one. Um, and I, I do think that um, uh, what COVID has highlighted to us is how important investment in an ethic of care is across the care spectrum to be able to respond to the emergencies we face, such as the pandemic or climate change. Um, and I do think that there's an important role for, for men, and this is something from the Men Care Fatherhood campaign that we've been increasingly focused on in, in that role of supporting a, a broader ethic of care. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is also very, very interesting. And you brought up a, a, a good point, uh, 
with a question, what influence do female MPs have? And it is so important, uh, and I, I fully agree with you, that um, that female uh, politicians, female members of, of parliament or, or ministers are not only in the soft, and I'm not agreeing that, that child care and social issues are necessarily soft, but what is termed as the soft issues, because we need equality around the around the the cabinet table um so that is that is a a, a very very important um, very important point this has been great the discussion so far has been great and we have uh, have identified a number of, of very very important issues the role models the 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 uh, both in in what hanna said and and now with the uh, with um the comment that I that I just uh, uh, repeated from from Vessel, um, but now turning to the second half uh, of the of the debate before we open up for for questions from the Q and A uh, from the audience, uh, we have a second poll question, and I encourage everyone who's who's uh, online to participate. and And the question is up now. And the question is, where do you think most meaningful changes can be made? Uh, at home, in the workplace, in the school, online? And of course, we could have put a hundred, a hundred places. Um, so this is, this is an indication of where change happens, uh, that we want to, that we want to get your opinion on. Um, we will, while we wait for the, for the, Answers. I will again uh, start with Hisen uh, about about um, in your in your previous in your previous uh, intervention. You spoke about the discriminatory laws and 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 social norms. And the the question really is who is responsible? I mean, what can we do? Who is responsible for for tackling and changing them? How can we do it? Uh, and beyond that, uh, enforcing the new laws and norms. I mean, how do we get to the root of the problem? And our audience uh, are almost, almost uh, think almost home and schools are the most important places to to make change. Thirty nine percent at at home, forty five percent at school, and then the workplace. But again, the online is 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 not uh ranked as high as has sort of the the more traditional places yes in in addition to the question i just posed what do you think of the the question do you do you agree with the audience <laughs> yeah thank you um i in any case i think what we really want to uh, see is that changes are made everywhere um but yes i do agree with uh the poll uh question uh the the responses and i think it actually gives us quite some insights as well to start more in the uh private sphere but also in a, a early age that's why i believe um a lot of respondents have also pointed out to uh schools um but i want to come back to um this uh, your question on the reforming laws and norms, um, uh, norms changes and so on, which should actually go hand in hand. And I also wanted to revisit a little bit where um, what Nalia, Naila has mentioned already earlier. Uh, sometimes legal reforms do follow certain changes in how societies views certain issues. Uh, but sometimes also laws are there first in the hope that social norms will follow uh, to change. Korea and Japan are some examples um, for this, uh, the quite um, uh, exemplar in that sense. They are, to, they are the two countries where they have the most generous parental leaves, including the parental leaves, but the take-up ratio is quite low because of the social norms. I personally have a couple of male friends back in my country in Korea who actually decided not to take paternity leave. Uh, for his second baby because he had such a traumatic, uh, traumatic experience with his first baby when he took the paternity leave, especially with, the, uh, with his colleagues and friends uh, sort of stigmatizing him. 
So uh, laws should obviously be there, but then um, there's another thing, the momentum for social changes should follow in a, a separate and in, in parallel. And on your question for um, who is responsible for tackling and changing uh, so, such social norms, I honestly think it should be all of us. Um, and this is why we at the center always talk about the importance of the whole of society approach, right? But obviously, because also everyone has a role uh, to play in this societal shift. But again, uh, we obviously need to start somewhere. And for sure, there are specific actors that are in better positions and have the responsibility and power to act. But what I really want to emphasize, though, is um, that social norms changes and potentially the necessary legal reforms, too can really be made and also can have the momentum for the meaningful change when it actually is happening in the private spheres and also in the community level. So parents at home have a key role as the first educator of their children um, and their roles to provide a role model and also to shape the values are very important. For instance, um, our recent SIGI country study in Cote d'Ivoire uh, it found that while majority of parents with children under the age of 16 still prefers their son's education over daughters, because in parents' eyes, especially in father's eyes, education is seen more valuable for boys than for girls. And in majority of households, the father is the main decision maker when it comes to children's education. Um, so we also find that in households where decisions are actually made jointly by the couple, both father and mother, rather than just by a father, which is actually the most of the cases, these households are more likely to send their girls to school. So the joint making in couple is quite important that can be seen in a private sphere. Um, then secondly, as I mentioned in uh, the work of the community level, uh, we also find it very important to involve and work with traditional religious community leaders as they play a very important role in promoting behavioral change at the individual at, and at the community levels. Uh, we have evidence from Tanzania, for instance, awareness raising campaigns, workshops and trainings that were targeted to community leaders on the causes and consequences of intimate partner violence really had an impact on the decrease of such violence because they could really encourage the victims and survivors of violence to report and to get necessary support. The spillover impact was clear. More women and girls get to know about their rights and they get to also know uh, how violence cannot be justified. So then the men who were reported uh, also get to use violence a bit less and then it gears towards general mindset changes from victim blaming to perpetrator blaming. Another example, uh, traditional religious leaders and other gatekeepers like healthcare staffs are also in a unique position to change um, beliefs given their uh, local influences, especially in championing the end of harmful practices such as girl-child marriage or female genital mutilation and cutting. Uh, finally, I also want to make a point on the data issues. Changing discriminatory social norms is not possible without knowing exactly what to change and where to change. And also social norms changes are not linear process. There is no permanent advancement. It can always go backwards as we have seen recently. Thus, it is very important to keep monitoring and we at the Development Center stand ready um, to provide the data that makes it possible through our work on the CIGI and also our continued data production and analysis efforts uh, on the masculinity front. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hirtian. Uh, very interesting. And, and, and I thought it was particularly interesting what you said about the, the experience of the paternity leave in Japan and Korea. Um, again, drawing from, uh, from uh, the example of, of uh, Hana in my country, Iceland, um, this is exactly what, what uh, was managed to change, uh, to, to change in the year 2000 when the legislation on maternity and paternity leave uh, was, was uh, changed. Uh, I had the privilege, and this is what I'm 
I think, proudest of in my political life. I was on the, the committee that wrote the bill uh, in my previous, in my previous uh, capacity. And what we did was to uh, make it equal between the mother and the father, uh, non-transferable. And then we had um, uh, a transferable or, or three months it was three months for the father, three months for the mother, and then three months that they could choose between uh, themselves. But the the dedicated months to either the mother or the father were not transferable. So that gave men the power when it came to their uh, employer to say, "Listen, uh, we need childcare for for our little little baby." Uh, if I don't use this, this will fall down uh, and nobody can use it. So this, you, they were, the employer was not allowed to, to reject it. And all of a sudden, or uh, over the course of, of the years, society transformed. And, and it was a human, humongous uh, change in norms. Because now, if you would ask, this is 22 years later now, if you would ask a young father, uh, you know, or a father that you saw that was not going to take paternity leave. Everyone's like, why? Why wouldn't Why wouldn't you take? Uh, you know, what's What's the matter with you? So the norms have changed, and and going uh, to to vessel on that on that notion, uh, Equimunto is a is a, a producer of the state of the world's father fathers uh, global report. So this is sort of segueing into that. Um, can you can you tell us more about how to call in men, uh, whether it's at, at home or in the political sphere as as allies in this in this um, battle, if you will? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, I, I um, first of all, whether at home or in the political sphere, that the home is, of course, the political sphere. Um, and, and 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 vice versa. So that the, the public political sphere, but the political sphere at home. And I, I think the the experience that you shared, Hessian, just to reflect on my own, I, I certainly built confidence in my own competence to care for my daughter and my son when I had paid paternity leave, and I was left alone with my child, um, and it was only up to me to do that. So, I, but I I do think that so that's very much at the individual personal level, but. I do agree with the, the, the need for the, the structural and social norm support for that to be able to, to happen for, for all parents. Um, coincidentally, in South Africa, there's actually a case that's now going to the High Court, which is challenging the constitutionality of our current uh, parental leave regime and proposing non-transferable equal paid leave for all parents. Um, so and not through the parliament, but through the through the uh, 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 strategic litigation process. So that's a really exciting case to, to look out for. Um, I think on going to the state of the world's fathers, what over the years that we've produced the report, we've seen two extensions. The first one is to go beyond fatherhood. Fatherhood is a really important individual entry point into a conversation around gender equality for men. So we will never lose the entry point of fatherhood, but it's really important that that is embedded in the broader conversation of care equality. Um, and then the second uh, extension is, is of course, to, to think about the, the, the connection to women's rights movements, um, that it's, uh, it's more movement and less academic, but more connected to the actual political nature of, of this work on, on, on care equality. I think the, um, it, what we have proposed to change, to move the needle, and what the State of the World's Father's evidence backs is uh, something that we call the main care commitment. It is a commitment that states can make for five steps towards uh, uh, care equality. Parental leave, so in the, in the dimensions that you've mentioned, um, subsidized high quality child care, uh, support for the health sector to provide antenatal support for fathers' engagement, high quality social norms campaigns, and disaggregated data on time use. So those five things we think are really strategic and, and that states, we are inviting states, members of parliaments to commit to working on one or more of those. Um, I just want to close on the point of the poll, um, noting uh, schools as an opportunity and to include in schools the early childhood education uh, sector. 
and that I, I do believe that ECD and men's engagement in ECD is a, is a really strategic opportunity. Um, firstly, as parents, but secondly, as paid care workers, because that normalizes men's care as competent and trustworthy care. Um, if men increasingly start to work as paid caregivers within the ECD space. Um, I, I, I look forward to, to, to seeing everybody when we launch the next State of the World's Fathers report in Kigali in July in 2023. And, and this definition of care and the way we engage in care is the central focus of that report. So, so um, let me pause there. Thank you so much, Raga. Thank you. When did you say the report will be out? We are launching the next State of the World's Fathers report in July 2023 July. At, at the Women Deliver Conference. And then you will go back to Kigali. Yes, exactly. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vessel, for this uh, a very interesting aspect of, of gender equality. Um, we're, we're all in this together. Uh, turning to you, Naila, um, and maybe going to the, the uh, heart of the Development Center. You are a, a professor of, of gender and development. Um, when it comes to advancing gender equality in, in developing countries today, what, what do you think it's lacking and, and what do we need more of? Where's the, where are the gains? What can we do to advance it? I think um, not just in developing countries, but perhaps more urgently in developing countries. I think a lot of interventions around gender equality have been structured around individual progress structured around making women better entrepreneurs or making women, you know, better political leaders. But they haven't been structured around breaking down isolation, you know, breaking down the walls between different groups of women, breaking down women's isolation within the home very often, or, you know, struggling away in the marketplace on their own. So, and yet we cannot get change without collective pressure and collective movement. So I would like to see much more of you know, progressive development interventions constantly asking the question, how do we design interventions, whether they're for school, whether they're for adolescents, whether they're for the elderly, that will allow people who share the same kinds of interests and have the same stake in seeing change happen, allow them to come together and kind of amplify their uh, efforts and even have the space to think about problems and what their solutions might be. So you would get a much more bottom-up and a grassroots-based set of solutions. So I think too much of development has kind of worked to formula. You know, it works here, it must work there. But of course, it worked there for certain reasons. And you need to understand what other constraints in other places that make them problematic. So I think this business of, you know, top-down and bottom-up you do need the state, you do need legal change, because laws to me are, the, the positive aspect of laws is they can break free from custom and religion and all the retrogressive forces of the past. So laws can, you know, open up a, a, a vision of a, a much more egalitarian future, but laws on their own will never be enough. So I would like to see far more effort into whether you're talking about women as entrepreneurs, whether you're talking about education, whatever, to build the collectivity, to build that spirit of working together. And I think in the, um, in the chat, people talked about Iran. And of course, we're all now looking through social media at the really amazing things that are happening in Iran. And that is a collect, you know, it came together. I don't know how it came together. What was the spark that brought, but years of, of repression, but what is also extraordinary about Iran is there are so many men on the streets. So this is not about taking the hijab off alone. It's about a battle against a theocratic autocracy, about repression of human rights, and something that has hit both young men and women and mothers and fathers together. So I think it's that spirit of collective action. How do we nurture it rather than individualize people um, in in the road to development, wherever that is. One other thing I would like to say, and at schools, you know, if we're talking about the kind of crucible of social norms outside the home, which is often a very retrogressive place, I find 
you know, we could do much more to make education a force for progressive ideas. And, you know, how does one get young boys and young girls to become friends, to look at the same aspirations, you know, not competing aspirations, this is your role and this is my role. And I think schools reformed, reformulated, could be something like that. And the reason I say that is for a long time, you know, demographers have worked with this idea of the boringly inverse relationship between maternal education and child survival. The more educated you are, the more likely the positive relationship, the more likely your children are to survive. And that's on very poor education, poor quality education in very poor countries. If that little amount of education can have that power to make women better mothers, then a redesigned education could have the power to make us all better human beings and better citizens. So I really think that education, it takes you out of the home, it puts you in a place where you're supposed to be learning, but what you learn is going to be hugely important. Thank you, thank you very much. The, the importance and power of education is, is always the, it, it always comes to the center of a solution to a problem. And you you uh, pointed that out very well, and also with a with a sense of uh, collectiveness, um, the Iranian example and the observation that the the number of men um, that is absolutely uh, absolutely correct when you when you see what's happening there, and that's a that's a positive sign. Hanna, something that uh, we also have in common, not only our our Icelandic nationality, but we are are both former ministers and, and had the pleasure of sitting in the in the same uh, government uh, way back when. Um, you work a lot on, on women's leadership and, and political participation. It's as you as you uh, pointed out in your in your uh, first intervention, it's it's still largely restricted. Um, how how do we solve it? How do you get uh, past the ten percent that you mentioned. How do we, how do we uh, get women to to participate and and fill that space? I remember you once uh, given a, a a very interesting example uh, from your mother. Uh, it did like a statistical count on on how many how many women were uh, involved in politics as role models uh, when she was. At that point, our age probably much younger than we are today. Uh, so, so how do we do it? Thanks, Raka. I wish it was a really sort of uh, simple answer to it. But I think, <clears throat> and the example that I have taken here from Iceland, because this is my answer when people say or nations say this cannot be done. Then I would say, okay, uh, I would say I'm fairly young. I'm I'm turning 56 tomorrow, so that's my age. My mother is 78 and I have daughters that are just around 20. When my mother was born, there was no female MP in Iceland. She didn't see a female MP. She didn't see it as her role. She didn't see it as her opportunity. When I was born, there was one. There was only one when I was born. My daughters now look at the parliament of Iceland and it's 50-50. And this is me just saying it can be done and it should be done. And when you say, Raka, what can we do? And this is me getting maybe uh, a bit tired of the endless discussion around why this needs to change and wanting to move into the how. And also me sort of saying it from a bit of a frustra uh, frustration or point of view, if you like. Uh, it's not the women that needs to change. We are constantly talking about how women should adjust better to politics, how they should be softer or harder or this or that or change in some shape or form. Politics simply need to change. And we know it's still in 2022. And I think, I mean, I work with women leaders across sort of every region and around the world. This is still a man's game. And whether we like it or not, it still is the ma a man's game. It was created by man and it has been run by man. And they see us still as inviting us to their space, if you like. And that cannot be the case. So instead of constantly telling women to change, to be presentable and to be the way we are supposed to be in politics, 
we should demand the politics to make the necessary change so women feel as much a part of that game, if you like, as men do. And I think uh, what is really interesting and was pointed out by Niall earlier, because he was mentioning, what is this doing to our young women that look at this and say, this is neither my space nor place, nor is anybody sort of allowing me to be part of it in my own sort of uh, capacity. Uh, I would like to add that this is, of course, an issue with young women, but this is just as much an issue. And the biggest issue in Icelandic politics today is not that we don't get young women to enter. We don't get the women to stay. Men stay way longer. Women leave way earlier because of this trend that I'm talking about, because it's still their game. And this is really bad for politics because women don't get to root themselves in it. They don't get to network the way they should, et cetera, et cetera. So this leaves me, Raka, to saying, and I know my younger self would have said, are you seriously saying this? Because I was firmly against quota in my younger days. But sort of walking the walk, not just talking the talk, has led me to the conclusion, firm belief that numbers matter and they matter so much that we might need to sort of swallow our sort of younger views of this, that we need quota. The only way to do this is if the po political parties, if the nations aren't going to do it like it should be done, a diverse people, not just women and men, just diverse group of people representing their nations, we might see quota, and I know that that is sort of criticized by many, but I'm just pointing out that that is the fastest way to make these changes. And this is what we did and Raka was talking about. And if I were to, if somebody were to ask me, what can Iceland bring to the world, wrap it in and give for gender equality? Paternity leave is number one, two, and three. Absolutely, the, by far the biggest success thing that Iceland did is to allow men in the same way as women, to leave their work to take care of their kids. It changed everything. And it wasn't consensus to begin with. It was a harsh fight to convince that we needed to do it like that. And this is me again saying that we might need to sort of adopt quotas in a more progressive way than we do. And, and saying that, Raka, I would like to sort of echo what others have been saying. We can talk about law reforms. Of course we should. But we cannot just say, let's fix the law and make sure that they are equal. We need progressive law reforms when it comes to gender equality. We need to take the extra step of doing things like paternity leave that are seen as progressive. It's not about just evening what we have. It's about sort of taking the, the extra step, which is, which is really, really, really important. And I think on that note, we have made changes in Iceland. We've done beautiful and wonderful things, but still when we all sort of either, as uh, Naila said so beautifully earlier, if we have the sort of shape of how a leader should be and it doesn't fit women, it, we simply aren't seeing things moving fast enough. And I would also, Raka, just uh, sort of on, on these notes, uh, I think we also need to sort of, we're talking about education. And you remember, we all remember, I don't know how many of you know that the first democratically elected female president in the world is also from Iceland. And she was our president for many, many years, 16 years. And she said the transformation in Iceland was when she went into schools and the boys raised their hand and said, can, can boys become presidents? Because they were used to seeing a woman there for a long, long time. And just a personal story in the end, Raga, I think the, the moment when I realized that we in Iceland were experiencing humongous and life changing changes when it comes to gender equality is when my kids woke up in the middle of the night and cried out for my husband as well as myself. Meaning that he had taken care of them in the same manner that I did, and meaning that there was a dramatic change in the way that we would see the future of our daughters. So uh, progressiveness and numbers matters. I think these are sort of the solutions. Thanks. Thank you, Hanna. Thank you very much. And, and yes, I had that moment as well uh, when, my, when my older son called out in the middle of the night for my husband. And what did I do? I you know, pushed him away and said, 
I'm going to go. And I felt horrible. And then, you know, it took me, it took me uh, some time to realize this is exactly what needed to be done because we also have to let go. Um, quotas. Um, I think if, if some of our, uh, Older, older colleagues from politics would listen to this dev talk now. Uh, they would be very, very surprised at, at hearing uh, you advocate for quotas and me agreeing, uh, agreeing with you. Uh, but that goes to show that you go uh, grow wiser with 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 age, and it's okay to change um, change your opinion. Thank you, thank you very much. Now I would like to to let the the eager public in. There will there have been uh, uh, a lot of uh, activity in the in the chat, and we we are doing well on time. Uh, so we have about twenty five minutes uh, for for questions. And before we reach out and and address some of the questions, and I will I will get to that in a in a minute. Uh, I'd like to kick off. Uh, by using my privilege as, as moderator to give the floor to Nyav Pallon. Uh, she is the Irish, uh, she's from the delegation permanent representation to the OECD from Ireland, uh, as well as UNESCO. And she will share some, some insights from Ireland. Ireland, of course, is a, is a, a very staunch and good member of the development center. So I am, I'm, uh, very interested in, in hearing from Nyav. Who I hope I did not, uh, whose name I'm hoping that I did not butcher. The floor is yours. I understand that she's been oh my gosh. into the. My God, excuse me, it's a little bit. She was connected, but she um, she's not anymore. She had probably a issue with. Uh, okay, let me thing. let me just know uh, when she connects again, hopefully, uh, and we will get the question in. Um, in the meantime, we have. Uh, several questions from the from the audience, and I will just take them in the the order of appearance. There's a there's a comment um, from a, a Sipora Kamo from from Kenya, uh, who who says, "How can we take these conversations to the the grassroots uh, conversations on 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 social norms and and all of the issues that we've been talking about?" Uh, to the grassroots so that we can sensitize women on the importance of women leadership in very patriarchal uh, communities where fellow women don't believe that a woman can lead. So how can we change the, the social norms uh, within, the, within the grassroots? Um, who would like to, I'm looking at you, he's uh, in, maybe if you would like to, to give it a go or, or anyone who raises the hand. First, Naila. Uh, you're you're muted. Ah, no, I'm I'm sorry, I I hadn't raised my hand. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, he's in. Is it up? Yes. Uh. Uh. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, yes, I do definitely echo um, with this comment also because every time we are actually talking with uh, our partner countries, especially when it comes to CD, to really talk about the social norms and how do we actually make the changes. Um, then And then we also hear this point that um, the points that is normally being brought by the grassroots organizations are not really conveyed to the decision makers. Mm -hmm. um, say that there's not much platform uh, where everyone can actually get together, actually, let's say in a very simple manner, who actually thinks, uh, who actually thinks, who knows what is necessary to be changed and who can actually make the changes because they are already in that position. These two groups are not necessarily meeting all time together. So um, this is probably one thing where we can really um, make more voices to grassroots so that the actual changes can happen. Because again, if grassroots organization or all different type of feminist uh, movements are only happening in silos on, uh, just with them, uh, it's just a lot of noise there and actual changes cannot really be made. So again, I would just like to uh, mention very quickly, um, it's important to again, uh, make a collective movement so that we can make the collective efforts. The word collectiveness, collective, 
uh, keeps popping up in this conversation. And I think that uh, not without a, a, a reason. Hannah, you have your hand up. Yes, I think that this is a really, really important point. I think that sort of, uh, and this was mentioned by other panelists as well, and that is the beauty of gender equality. If we see the positive thing, mm -hmm. that is that most of the people that dive into the solutions around it actually end up with a similar position on it. This is me sort of, uh, sort of also reminding people that see Iceland as the champion it is on gender equality. It's a fairly consensus driven issue in Icelandic politics. From left to right, there is consensus around the biggest sort of um, things that we have done around gender equality. And this is me just pointing out that I think that we tend, or at least when we, I was in politics and when we sort of look at it, we tend to see the grassroots as a bit of a disturbing factor. Do you know what I mean? We don't sit down on a, a, a fair level and say, okay, let's have a conversation around this. Uh, and I think that there is so much that has been done when it comes to gender equality. And we need to, we think the guys in the history that changed history, we tend to forget to thank all these women that took a dramatic fight to make sure that we had the rights and we had sort of a better future for our kids and ourselves. So I think that we need to sit down, and this is, for example, Raka, what we do at the Reykjavik Global Forum in Iceland. We meet across sectors. We have politicians, we have NGOs, we have feminist movements, we have uh, the business side, we have international organizations, because the conversation among those is so important. And the mutual respect of seeing the grassroots movements as the source, so the change makers that they have been is for me absolutely vital. So I think the legislators tend to say, okay, ooh, they, they, they tend to see the grassroots movements as demanding, 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 instead of finding some kind of common ground that I actually think is there. So uh, I would like to flag that. Thanks. Thank you very much. And now Hi. your hand is up, Naila. It's a question to... Uh... Zipporah, Zipporah, uh, about, you know, she, she, she vied for political leadership. Obviously, she had a, not a very good experience that women at the grassroots level don't believe in women as political leaders. But that's not, it doesn't stop there. I mean, I just mm -hmm. wondered if her experience campaigning at the grassroots level didn't leave behind some kind of change that perhaps the next woman who comes along and tries to fight it. So I'd really like her to follow up on what went on when she ran her campaign, because she is she's making change, you know, but change doesn't happen overnight. Thank you. That is that is a very good point. And, and if you are if you are still with us, uh, Sipora, uh, we would love to hear more. Uh, but now I got the message that uh, Nya Pallon from the Irish Permanent Representation to the OECD and UNESCO is, is back online. Uh, and I will give her the floor to share some insights from Ireland. Thanks, Raga, and apologies, everyone. Yeah, my connection dropped just, as, <laughs> just at a very crucial moment there, which is unfortunate. There's, there's always yeah. one moment like that. <laughs> It seems it's just, yeah, at least everyone's used to it now, <laughs> having, having had our, our time with COVID. Um, just, yeah, I mean, I can speak in, in praise of the Development Centre's work in this area and, you know, from the perspective of having applied um, research on, on gender norms um, to our own national data and as that layer beneath the laws, I think, was was a very um, interesting comment uh, made by the panellists. Um, so we we applied the model set out in, in the Man Enough report to national data and, um, you know, began our, our analysis of the 10 norms of restrictive masculin masculinities that that sets out. Um, and our report was published last December. Um, so this was driven by we had policy commitments um, to look into into promoting positive gender norms and, and challenging negative ones, um, including through research and, and awareness raising. So this was this was a tool for us to be able to do that. Um, and I mean, I can provide a flavour of the findings. Um, it's interesting, I think um, it was mentioned already that that sort of divide between, um, you know, the, the laws in place to, to allow parents to take, to allow fathers to take parental leave and then the take up of that. So despite the majority of the population approving of a man taking parental leave um, in applying the, the Dev Centre um, framework, we found that almost half of all eligible fathers didn't 
didn't actually use their paternity level or paternity benefits sorry in 2018 so that's an interesting um it's always an interesting dynamic um, but more broadly just apart from the actual findings themselves the work is going to support a number of next steps including our evaluation um, of, of the equality strategies that, that have been in place um, and enhancement of our national data capacities in this area, which um, was in fact one of the notable challenges of, of the exercise. Um, it exposed some significant data gaps for us. And again, chiming with, with what has been said in discussion already, um, our researchers found that the data from Ireland is currently available for first of all only a small minority of the indicators, um, but the gaps are particularly prevalent in the private sphere and I noticed in the poll earlier you know education topped it but that that um the private the home was a close second um so our, our preparation also included a comparison with other countries and we could see that some data gaps were were unique to us relatively um but others were were more widespread um again particularly in the private sphere um but just in, from national experience as well um this focus on norms has been fruitful in, in a variety of areas and um, it's something we've highlighted in the context of of conflict through our engagement on women peace and security and then i guess closer to home um, we've also seen research on on masculinities on the island of ireland in the context of the role of, of youth in the ongoing promotion of peace at home so um that's just to share a flavor of of work from ireland but thanks for the opportunity to intervene thanks for a really interesting discussion so far as well thank you very much um it, the, the Irish example, uh, we're very proud of it here at the Development Center, because the Development Center, for those of you who don't know, is um, a, a center, um, it's a part of the OECD, but it's a special part because we have both OECD and non-OECD member countries, and were founded 60 years ago uh, at, the, at the initiation of, or suggestion of, of John F. Kennedy, who um, suggested that we would have countries of all income levels at the same table discussing development policies on an equal footing uh, to have mutual exchange and mutual learning. So this is such a, a, a perfect example of how we can be sharing across exactly that, across uh, income levels, the experience and, and, and co-create solutions. So thank you very much for your, for your contribution. Um, I would now like to turn again to the, the chat. Uh, the next question, uh, Iceland is taking over here. This is from the, the ambassador of Iceland, Unnur Orratos de Um She says here, and this, uh, I would like Vessel, maybe you, you get the first, first take on this. Very often gender equality campaigns are addressed at men, given that women take on most of the burden of primary care at home, and are in the forefront in primary schools, it would be interesting to know to which extent women are responsible for not changing gender inequality. Uh, do we have any evidence on, on women's role? And this goes kind of to the example that both Hannah and I experienced uh, when we, when we uh, heard our, our children cry out for their fathers in the middle of the night. Vessel, what's your, uh, Vessel, what's your, your take on that? Thanks so much for the question, um, Unur and, and, and Ragar. The, 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 so definitely, you know, the, the, um, the kind of standard of practice is gender synchronized approaches, because of course, gender norms are maintained by all genders. Um, it's, 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 it's not only men. I mean, men certainly benefit from the oppressive norms, but it, it is, as, as, as Nalia said, it, it takes a very long time to change. Um, it, in the images data, the International Men and Gender Equality Survey data, the, the questions have usually been directed at men and women, and um, uh, there certainly is some evidence in many of those surveys that uh, women also support some gender inequitable norms as much as men do. Um, not, not to the same extent, but, but there is some support. So it is, um, of course, uh, uh, you know, it, I think it also goes to the earlier point that we spoke about where um, the assumption that women would necessarily support more caring or kind of social welfare type legislation, um, it's really important to highlight that 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 support for women's rights or feminist uh, progressive legislation is important, um, and then that whoever is supporting that is is, is diverse across the sphere, um, and that it's it, there's no assumption that all uh, women politicians are necessarily feminist politicians, um, but yes, so of course, and I think the solution there is very much a gender synchronized approach, which works with all genders to progress norms forward.
thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I just I just got a message that you could hear me less last time, and that's because my I, my AirPods died, uh, but now they're they're back in action. I hope you can hear me. Uh, we still have ten minutes, and the questions keep coming. There's one for from uh, Daram Singh, uh, and regarding uh, what we we touched upon uh, earlier. Uh, the the economics of this. The most important factor uh, is economic inequality. We're more focusing on political and social factors rather than on the economic factors. The question is how we can make progress on economic gender equality. Um, sorry, that's a that's a, a a different different question. So economic gender equality. Who wants the first shot at that 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 uh, question. Naila, you have the floor. Well, I wanted to answer the question because it's something I work on a lot, much more than I work on um, social, cultural and political. At the same time, I really find it impossible to look at economics of inequality without looking at culture, law and politics. If we want to ask ourselves, what is it that leads, let's say, to the gender wage gap? We have to start with the allocation of roles, the customary allocation roles and the disproportionate amount of responsibility that women and girls take for the unpaid economy, care, uh, unpaid productive work and so on and so forth. That in itself, and that's your vision for your future, that is going to influence how much you invest in marketable credentials, you know, the things that might get you into uh, better jobs and so on. So that's for starters. And then you arrive in the market already hampered to some extent by all these uh, prior problems. And then you encounter discrimination. And discrimination is also cultural. You know, people's views of what you're good at, what are women good at, what are men good at, what are different uh, groups of men and women good at. And so you're up against stereotypes of various kinds that you also internalize. You know, you begin to think that you're not capable of giving orders, you're not capable of exercising authority, you're not capable of uh, leading teams. So, you know, to try and separate out the cultural, the social and the economic, I think misses the fact that markets and the economy is embedded within social norms, discriminatory laws and so on. Of course, we can start by asking, can we not change the laws that discriminate against women? And we can certainly do that, but it won't necessarily translate into changing practices again, unless we get round to that, that larger social. But what we can, what policymakers can do is what they can do, and that is deal with formal forms of discrimination and formal laws of discrimination. So this idea that you can somehow look at the gender wage gap as purely economic phenomenon, I think misses out on the roots of the gender wage gap within the cultural formation of a society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Heathen? Yeah, if I may just quickly, because I completely uh, echo with Naila. Um, when we really look at the economic uh, equality between men and women, obviously we talk about also vertical segregation and also the horizontal segregation, meaning that uh, we don't really find women in the higher positions practically. And we also don't really find women in a lot of different sectors uh, when we look at the sectors at the horizontal level. We see more women represented in certain care sectors or um, uh, let's say like service sectors, for instance. And then there are other sectors that are men, men are more um, dominated. And given that general setup already that comes from the such, uh, such social norms that is already being there, um, it's uh, sort of designed so far that some of the se sectors that are uh, male dominated is actually high, more highly paid. So mm -hmm. in that sense, without really just um, addressing the root causes, which are the social norms that are actually governing what women can do, um, what do better in certain sectors and in do better, what men actually do better in certain positions, uh, without really addressing them, it's very hard to break this uh, economic equality, I think. And also maybe just one more thing, because uh, what we found in Sydney, Tanzania, 
uh, what we found there is that women cannot not afford uh, cannot afford not to work because obviously with the income decision, I mean it's an income generating uh, strategy for the whole household. So women actually have to work for pay, uh, but with the permission of men, and that decision is coming from the household. So then again, um, to really talk about economic equality. A lot, a lot of the social norms, uh, the, the structural barrier should be uh, tackled either at the private sphere or also at the governing um, economic uh, sectors governing um, uh, spheres. Great, thank you. There is one question left uh, and we have four minutes. So I would like to uh, throw it at, at each and every one of you, but you know, one sentence. Uh, it's a question from Wendy Jacobs. Uh, given gender equality has been a priority for so many for so long, what do the panelists think? If they could make national policy, what would be the key intervention for a real transformation? Very quickly, I'm going to start with with Vessel this time. One uh, one national one one key intervention. Yeah. Um, uh, I would echo Hannah and say uh, uh, non-transferable paid parental leave for all parents. Sorry, Thank I took you. a gap there. <laughs> no, very good, very good. Thank you. Uh, Hishin. That's a very difficult one. I would just again turn um, it to legal frameworks because still that is one necessary thing. So at least to make laws that are... Um, uh, at least the laws the international conventions are saying, so the national countries can actually adopt uh, such laws. Thank you. The legal framework. Uh, Naila. I would go for transformative education. Get them young and change their trajectories. <laughs> <laughs> get, them, get them while they, where they're still uh, yeah. <laughs> receptive to, to the yes. information. Yes. And, and Hannah. Your, your parental leave has been taken, so you have to pick another one. Yeah, and, and I would say that as the legal progressive uh, reform I would like to see, but I would also like to encourage all national governments and everybody in the world to look at their framework of law and make sure that it's equal. Uh, and that goes for the, for the general sort of outline of it all. But in the end, Raga, I, would, I think I would like the world... Uh, to unite around listening. I think that the gender equality issue, we are too long having to prove a case instead of us just being sort of to put the case forward. So I think if people were just to listen, men and women to the stories of girls and women around the world, see their realities and sort of accept them, we would see loads of loads of things happening and changing. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... And to, to all of you, um, I don't really need takeaways, but, but just like a couple of things that, that to me stand out. It's the, the first that, that, that laws and social norms are the, are the start of change. Uh, but we, we can't forget uh, that the laws themselves are driven by cultural norms and, and they don't do it uh, without the other. Um, and a, 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 a tokenistic change that, that doesn't drill down into reality will have no effect. The legislation is not enough. Change to happen, we have to be practical, we have to listen, uh, grassroots action must come to, to, to into play and, and, and promote a change. Um, the second change is, is not a, a linear process. Uh, we need better data uh, and, and we need to know whether we are actually, uh, whether, whether gains are sustained. Um, and also, finally, I think uh, the the question of role models, I think you said it, Hannah, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Uh, we are, uh, as uh, women are invisible in, in political leadership in, in, in far too many places in the world. Uh, and that needs to be changed. It's a, it's a vicious circle. Uh, someone mentioned self-censoring. Uh, I think it was Nyla. Um, and it's good that men are speaking out on, on these issues. And thank you very much, uh, Vessel. But we are still too short of, of, of men. We want, want this to be a conversation of, of 
uh, equals around the table. And, and that's the only way that we can get the dialogue and get the change uh, driven in full force. And finally, another um, advertising seg segment, uh, segment here to promote the next dev talk that I mentioned earlier uh, on 20th of October on energy access or low carbon transition. Do we need to choose another, as I said, a burning, burning topic? Uh, we will start at 3 p.m. Uh, Paris time CET and and uh, information and, and registration links are in the chat. But dear panelists, dear audience, thank you for your fabulous questions and thank you for your fabulous expertise. Uh, hope to, to see you again and, and continue the conversation while we still have uh, the job to do. Until we, until we conclude, we will keep the conversation going. Thank you very much, thank you. everyone. Thank you.